processes and tools dominate today's Agile discussions, but we are devoted to the individuals and interactions that make it work. From the beginner to the veteran practitioner, we have something for you. Welcome to Agile for Humans. Welcome to this week's episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. We bring amazing Agilists together to share their ideas about agility in today's fast-paced world. We examine current Agile tips and practices with the goal of helping you become an Agile leader in your organization. Please be sure to rate us and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, and subscribe on Patreon at ryanripley.com. Thank you, as always, for supporting the show. In exchange for supporting this program, we can continue to bring you great guests and insights from the Agile community. With multiple subscriber levels, you can help make this show even better. We are always taking your questions and comments about the show via email, ryan at ryanripley.com, or on the ryanripley.com website. Leave us a comment in the post, and we'll be sure to answer it on the next show. Joining me today are Don McGreal and Ralph Jokum. These, uh, these two guys have just finished writing a book on uh, product ownership. It should be released here a little bit before this podcast goes live. We'll have links to all that in the show notes, but really wanted to get Don and Ralph together uh, so that we could talk about the bookmaking process, kind of how, how that process works, and even product ownership, the, the, the dark arts behind this, mystery, this mysterious role that uh, seems to cause many Agile teams confusion and trouble. So Ralph and Don, welcome, and, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you for having us. You know, first and foremost, just want to say congratulations on on the book. Um, being in the middle of of working on one myself, I completely understand the toil, misery, and pain you go through uh, trying to put one of these together. And uh, just a, a huge congratulations to you guys. It's a it's a major accomplishment. Thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah, it was uh, it was about a uh, year and a half, two years, I guess total. Um, but uh, but it wasn't. You know, I kind of enjoyed it. I liked uh, working with with Ralph, uh, all that time. And we really got to know each other. Well, yeah, it was, it was a, a great experience. And, uh, with all the ups and downs going through that, sometimes you kind of think, Oh God, what did I get myself into it? But at the very end, once you, you have it, you're really proud of what you did. And it was, again, uh, it was a really good experience also to work together with Don and, uh, learn from him and, uh, you know, put all of our ideas together. So this book is, it's the professional product owner, Leveraging Scrum as a competitive as a competitive advantage. Uh, what can you tell us about the book as as far as the the focus, the center, the underlying message? You know, what have you tried to bring forward to the community uh, as this uh, as this book hits the shelves? Well, I think the title is uh, is it important. I mean, we we went back and forth on the title quite a bit. Um, it's really about being a professional product owner. We toil with maybe product manager even, um, but it, it's about the product owner being number one, and then seeing Scrum not as some project management tool, but as a competitive advantage for your product, for your company, for your organization. Um, so, so we really tried to bring that out in the book, and we really wanted to turn upside down this traditional way of thinking of a product owner as somebody that writes a bunch of user stories and has to get into details it, it, to something a lot more strategic. And, and what Don just mentions about strategic, but we also kind of building on top of the strategy as as you should kind of, you know, a clear vision as a product owner and putting that into a strategy. Also kind of really get in the focus on value, you know, getting away from this project thinking to a product mindset uh, in order to really generate value, you know, go out there and, you know, have happy customers. So you guys use the word professional you know, in the title and also, you know, as being a part of scrum.org professionalism, uh, just it, it permeates through all of our training offerings and, and all of our courses and our philosophy. But there may be some listeners out there kind of scratching their heads saying, well, what is it? What's the difference between a traditional product owner and a professional product owner? Don, can you shed some light on and maybe Ralph can help as well? Uh, the, the word professional and professionalism and how how you see that really enhancing uh, the role of the product owner. Yeah, as, as well as professional Scrum trainers, um, Ralph and I uh, have been talking about this for a while. Where um, the, the the issue right now we have in our industry is is we take kids right out of college and say, "Hey, you took a you took an HTML class in college. Here's a multi million dollar project to work on." 
And um, there, it's unlike any other industry out there where we just throw people at problems and, and there's no real apprenticeship, there's no craftsmanship, there's no professionalism in our industry. And, and you might even assert that software is not a, pro- a profession at this point. So um, a lot of that rings through throughout all the training in Scrum.org because their mission is improve the profession of software delivery. Um, and we talk about professional Scrum masters, professional Scrum developers, and then professional Scrum product owners. And, and the, where we see uh, this when it comes specifically to product owners is um, don't just see it as a job where you're fielding, you're, you're receiving lots of requirements from customers, from management, and you're just now handing them off to a team. A true professional product owner is one that initiates these things, thinks about their customers, thinks about value to the custom to their to their customer and also to their organization, and starts to think: Is this how I would spend my money every sprint? Am I getting the right return on investment? Am I getting enough value out of this? Um, that's a, that's a professional in our in our world and in how we like to talk about them in the book. So to build on top of what Don just said, so we, we go so far as we what we favor, what we try to, we call it the entrepreneurial mindset. So we want that the product owner thinks and acts like an entrepreneur. And we strongly believe that it's even possible because sometimes people in our training say, but I work for a large enterprise. I can't be an entrepreneur. Maybe not in a technical sense, like having your own startup, but you could still have the entrepreneurial mindset, you know, and network, talk to people, you know, get things going. You know, don't take no as an answer and just keep on, you know, struggling day in, day out in order to really get the best possible product out there. So as, as trainers and as coaches and consultants, I know the three of us see a lot of different organizations. We see a lot of different scenarios uh, th- through your time as, as product owners and as trainers and as coaches and consultants. What are some of the craziest anti-patterns or some of the biggest problems that you're seeing in that product owner space uh, that you're hoping that that this book helps solve, and maybe we can start with Ralph on this one. Okay, so most companies still think in projects, and and, and I think that that's a big problem because a, a project essentially turns everything around. Because because before you can start a project, you have to tell how much you know scope, schedule, budget, um, and then as a good project manager, you deliver on scope, on time, on budget, whether you deliver the right thing. That could actually be a secondary thought. So we want first to get out of this project mindset to a product mindset. Basically, you deliver a product to a customer providing value, you know, making this customer happy. Um, and by this, getting good positive feedback and people talk good about the product. And so, therefore, you know, more people buy it and the revenue goes up and, and, and everybody is, is, is happy. So, this is kind of where we want to get people to think about products. And then the other thing is that often what we see is that even though they have a product owner, it's often just a tiny component within a company. So, you have product owners for this service, product owners for that tiny bit Uh and then you have to coordinate all of, of that. So the question is really, what is your product? And you have to think hard about that. And, and uh, usually what, what, what I think is that people go too low with their products. You have to go as high as possible. You shouldn't go too high, but let's say for, let's talk about an insurance company I was recently with. Um, I mean, it's a whole insurance company providing life insurance, car insurance, all kinds of different insurances. And we came up with, at the end, we probably need about 10 to 12 product owners for the whole insurance. Uh, and this gives you an idea about how we want to scale actually product ownership up. John, how about you? Yeah, some of the things that I see over and over and over again are um, one of the things we hit on a lot. We hit it in the book, but also in our classes is is product owners not being strategic enough, thinking more as well, we, we use the term scribes um, or like secretaries for the teams. Um, you know, I've, I, I've had people in my classes say things like, you know, sometimes I just feel I'm their secretary or their, I go to these meetings with the customer and development teams are saying things like, Hey, this is important. You should probably write this down. And they're just, they're just jotting things down for the team. They're getting more details. Um, we really aim to change that, to make them more strategic is, is in so far as, you know, even saying that they're not even responsible for writing the stories, get help for that. Um, we want you to think about these things more strategically um, and, and get the people on the team helping out with this stuff. Um, get help. 
And the other thing I so see a may- lot. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, but it's just, uh, I was teaching a class in, in Berlin a couple of months back and uh, a product owner training. And I go, yes, I'm a product owner. I just said, great, so talk a little about it. Yeah, I'm the product owner for testing. And this kind of really <laughs> kind of uh, took me over because, I mean, how can you be product owner for a, a, a thing you need to do, but it's not really a product. So sometimes it is really heavily misunderstood what product ownership really means. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we and actually another interesting another interesting point here, um, and and is in in our book we try to define what a product is because sometimes they don't even know what a product is. A lot of these bigger organizations don't know what their products are. It's a little bit easier when you're a software product company and you've got a series of products that you're supporting. But when you're just one system out of many that hands off, that like there are component teams working on like back end systems. It's just, sometimes it's very hard to determine what your products are. And one of the areas what we focus on is, is basically we make an assertion. If you're working on something, if you have a customer, then you have a product. If you can determine who the buyer is and who's actually using it, there's a consumer and there's a buyer in terms of customers, then there is a product that, that exists. Then the question needs to be though, is it a viable product? So even in the case that Ralph mentioned, like I've got a that we're, I'm the product owner of testing. Could testing be its own product? Well, I would ask first, who's paying for the testing? What's the value proposition of, the, of this separate testing group? Um, is it to increase quality? Well, then let's measure that to see if we're going to be improving that. And then who's the consumer? Who's actually benefiting from this? Who's using the testing? Is it the other teams? What be- do they want this? Is this something that they're even asking for? Um, so in it, in that sense, I kind of look at everything as a product, even that. Just the question then is, is it a viable product? Is it actually going to give you the return on your investment that you think it will by having a separate testing group or a separate automation group? And in my experience, and I think what Ralph was alluding to, to as well, is that that doesn't exist. We've seen it over and over again in our industry. Well, and what I hear in that that, that <clears throat> conversation there is, uh, we're validating assumptions almost all the time. Is that a fair way to put it? Or, yeah, or maybe exactly. even a better term, yeah. maybe even a better term is validated learnings. Like we have these ideas, yeah. but but now we learned something and oh, now we know that we learned it. And, it, and perhaps far too often that's not happening in organizations. And the competitive advantage that Scrum provides a product owner is a way to validate their hypotheses. It, we're building complex things. So maybe the hypothesis is, is that if we had a separate testing group that you handed things off to, the hypothesis is that quality would improve. All right, well, let's prove it. Let's see what happens. Let's start measuring that. What's, a, what's a, an experiment we could try? Could we do this for a little while? How much are we willing to spend on it? Let's see if this actually work. Um, and, and even in that sense, you could see a product. Um, yeah. So also in the book, there's something we came up with and we call it the three V's. Um, so we think that every product owner should have a clear vision about what they want to achieve. Uh, and this can be really a far high stretch goal, which you might actually not be even able to achieve within the next couple of months, maybe even years, but it's it's a good vision. And, and then you do everything towards that vision. And uh, because of what you deliver, we also want to deliver the value to the users in the context of the vision. And then once you have it delivered, you need to validate whether, and this is also what Don was just kind of uh, addressing. So validate whether you have delivered the value. So vision, value, validation um and this is also something we really stretch heavily uh, and go into detail uh, throughout the book how you can come up with a vision how you can uh, you know uh, try to come up with the value what it means for the end users and and and, and practices how to validate it you know, we have uh, a chapter for each of the v's in the book and there's a lot of practical ways of achieving them too yeah, I, I actually had the opportunity, Don, to take your course uh, a few months ago. Uh, I think we were down in Plano for that. And uh, yeah. I was really, something that still I've been thinking about a lot lately is around vision. Uh, you do this really great discussion in your professional uh, Scrum product owner course around vision, and especially what happens when there is no vision. 
And what I what I have found in organizations, especially relating back to some of the previous conversations we've had about companies not knowing what their product is or if they have a product, uh, that lack of vision is really damaging to teams. Do you mind going into just a little bit of that that vacuum that happens and just that lack of vision and how damaging that could be? Yeah. So the way we kind of introduce the three V's is is to talk about a, a vacuum. Um, there's a vacuum between the direction your organization is going. Um, and then what your teams are doing day in and day out, sprint after sprint, what they're working on. Um, and if you're not careful, that vacuum will get filled with something. Um, and, and generally, you know, in a project minded organization, they fill it with project charters and Gantt charts and milestones and, and reports. Um, and it, the vision gets lost. It gets obfuscated um, when by the time it gets to the people that are doing the work. So we put a lot of we put it all on the product owner. Your job is to fill that vacuum when you fill it with the three V's. Your job is to just like an executive would for an organization, you are the executive of the product. Your job is to establish a vision if there isn't one. If there is one, then your job is to communicate it, make sure everybody understands it. Um, to maybe measure success in the terms of in terms of value. Um, to to communicate what to, what success looks like and how we're going to know when we get there. Um, and then to validate, to make sure that, you know, even your best hypothesis may be wrong. So how do we, how do we adjust as we go? Now, the better you do with that, the better you can communicate all the way down from vision, um, the more engaged your team members are going to be. So this is just going to make your life easier as a product owner, because you're going to see a much more motivated team. Uh, you know, your D- DBA, when they go home and they meet friends, they're not going to say they do database work during the day. I want them saying they save lives or they get their customers home earlier for dinner with their families, or I want them really connected to why we're building these products. That everything we do in Scrum, we should be showing it to somebody whose lives we're improving. And that's got to be very clear. Otherwise, why are we bothering with any of this? Somebody somewhere is, is, his life is getting better because of the work we're doing every sprint and product owners are responsible for um, making that clear. Not sure if that's exactly what I said in the class, but um, it's uh, somewhere along those lines. No, it, it's definitely along those lines, and it's just something that it's that vacuum that really stuck with me. That um, you know, if the product owner is not intentionally setting that vision day in and day out, and intentionally showing the impact of the product on on the lives of the customers, everything else just swoops in and fills that up. Whether it's developers deciding what to build next, or gold plating or Gantt charts or, or charters or, or, you know, a thousand page requirement documents, you know, mm-hmm. and that really did stick out. And it's a really awesome part of the first V. The second V Ralph is value. And I know in, in my professional scrum master courses, even in that, even in the PSM, uh, I get questions about value. And so when you, when you get hit with the, the question, you know, what is value? How do you find value? How do you define value? You know, I, I know that the book is almost 400 pages long, and I'm sure a lot of it is about answering that question. But more, more concisely, Ralph, how do you address the, the question of value and, and how, how would you recommend people explore what value means to them in their context? So um, value is kind of like a very generic, very broad term, which, which, which I think is is great about it but it's also a little bit uh, sometimes confusing uh, for people so value is like like what's beautiful and i think it really kind of it exists in the eye of the beholder so something which could be valuable for somebody else is not valuable for somebody different and so on so i think as a product owner you kind of you know when you get this idea about the the, the company uh, strategy where they want to go and the the idea the product vision you have it's truly really then how you get from from this 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 point of view into what's of value, and, and for this, it's it's really going out there, uh, talking to to users, uh, other stakeholders, everybody who has a has a say in, in this product or is interested in this product to to understand what they really need, and then come up with some. You know, we also talk about um, canvases in the training, like like the lean canvas or the business model canvas, and. In there, they talk about value proposition. So what do we propose? Which problems do we solve? And it's not really about the what yet. It's really about what problems are we going to, to change? What are we going, in, in which way are we improving people's life in the same way uh, Don talked about it before? And then once you have this idea, you can try to turn it into 
uh, items you put into your product backlog and then you implement them within a sprint and in a sprint review, that's a first instance for you where you can show it to stakeholders and collect some initial feedback. Even better if, if you're really done and you can make a release and see, hey, we had this hypothesis, we had this this idea about this feature could do this or that. And once you release that, uh, you can see whether the value actually happened. You know, if people started using it, if you get positive feedback, uh, all of those things. Yeah, and a lot of it then comes down to, and what you'll see where we get into metrics is going to be in that value chapter. Um, so it's just really coming down. To, we, we try to make it both strategic, but also practical, right? Things that you can actually measure and do um, to show value. And one of the goals is, is you know, you, there's always ways of, of gaming metrics, and it, it's sort of a... a, a uh, hot topic in the Agile community about what are good metrics versus bad metrics and um, what how you measure value. But it, at the very least, what I like using these for is to give give people something else to look at other than the typical metrics that we, we tend to equate to value. Um, you know, obviously the project-minded ones with like scope, budget, and, and uh, in time, you know, is, is does not equate to value. These are inside metrics that we use to manage our data day decisions and velocity is certainly one that's along those lines so just to get somebody just to give something else shiny to look at um i like to talk we like to talk a lot about these other types of metrics that equate to value like time to market or innovation um and so that we understand where we're going from a product standpoint and how we know when we get there well and that leads into the final v of validation uh and that's more of an intentional practice. That feels like something that if you're not planning for up front, you're going to have difficulties measuring on, on the back end. What are some of the tips that you guys have for um, ensuring that validation is a part of a product owner's daily practice or regular practice? Yeah, so we were talking about um, there's, two, there's two main ways to validate. Um, one is internally with your experts. Um, so... The the key tip there is, and this is what Scrum comes out of the box with this, if you're doing Scrum properly, you have a, a potentially shippable increment every single sprint. Um, so let's make use of that. Let's let's get people looking at this, using it, touching it, and getting feedback from that and, and immediately applying that into the backlog. So getting the mindset of you were never, we, we don't know exactly what we're building until we validate it. But even your smartest people in the world aren't going to know exactly what this thing is supposed to be. Um, until we test it against the marketplace. So you've got the internal expert validation, uh, but they, we want our product owners constantly thinking about what is their minimal viable product in order to actually ship. Um, so we, we get into more on this idea of, of uh, functional releases or you know, continuous delivery of shipping value as much as possible, but not just to get value back in terms of the return on investment, but also to understand if we're building the right thing, then what does the marketplace actually say about what it is we're building, um, which can give us the next best thing to build, allow us pivot opportunities going forward. And, and one of the other things which we also really stress clearly in the book is the, the importance of uh, having a release, because the only way you can actually ship value, and I just said it, is by shipping product, by releasing product. And if you only release once or twice a year, you only have to once and twice a year a chance to validate your assumptions. So if you do frequent releases, you have, and this is really everything about the empirical process control, you have much more possibilities to validate your assumption whether you're on the right track or not. Yeah, I, I think that's a, just one of the more important points, right? The point of Scrum is done. And, and getting to a releasable increment and getting that increment into the world and, and getting that feedback. I mean, that's, that's really why you take on the, the overhead of, of practicing Scrum. And so I think that's a great, I love the fact that you guys really highlight validation as, as being critical because without, as you both mentioned, without the product out in the world, we have no idea if it's valuable, useful, or helping people and improving their lives. So I love that focus. And I think that really, I think the three V's really, encapsulate that idea of professionalism that we started the conversation with. It's a clear vision, um, well understood value, and then validating all the things that we've, we've assumed up to even the, the question of value so that we have 
you know, clear data. It's it's almost like it's based on empiricism or something, right? <laughs> Exactly. exactly yeah. <laughs> I, I've been on. I've been on way too many projects where uh, we're working towards something, and, and everybody's just too afraid to release it. And we, we go six months to a year working on this thing, and we're using we're tapping ourselves on the back for using Scrum and building something that could go to production and getting feedback against our experts, thinking they know what's going on, um, and then releasing it and finding out that half the features are not even used. Um, uh, I've been on some pretty high pro- profile projects like that where we spent months um, of lost revenue working on this on a product that could make $10 million a month. Um, so one of the other things, things that nobody was even using. Sorry, I just, uh, I'm in a hotel right now in Athens and it looks like my internet is a little bit uh, dodgy right now. But So one of the things I also kind of stress also in the trainings and uh, it's about the difference between you know, having really something of value delivered, validated or making progress because... You know, you just mentioned it also, Ryan, about being done at the end of the sprint. Too many companies that just say, yeah, you know, this isn't working, that's not working. Uh, oh, let's just move on. Let's make progress. And I always say progress is great, but and it could mean a lot, but it also could mean nothing. And uh, so I also bring as an example, I mean, uh, I, I'm German, but the, the airport in Berlin, which was supposed to open in 2000. I think 12 it was, now it's 2018, so six years ago. And this thing is still not running this still is still not operational and right now it looks like 2021 so for over six years now more than planned they're still making progress and they're making progress for the next three years um but there's no usable product so progress again could mean nothing so i you know i I once had a boss who who you would ask um teams of people um are you looking busy right now or are you actually making money and uh I always thought that was an interesting way to put it. It's uh, you can walk around like the old uh, the Dilbert character with the papers in hands, walking quickly, looking busy, or you can actually get value and results. And and I, I that's always stood out to me. And I think it's uh, you know a, a big highlight. I think of what we've discussed here. Something else that I wanted to to kind of shift into. What's really interesting about this whole professional series uh, that that scrum.org uh, is doing is that both Don and Ralph, you're both the stewards of the professional um, scrum product owner course uh, through scrum.org. And what that means is, um, is that Don and Ralph work with Ken Schwaber and the rest of the PST, uh, the prof- professional scrum trainer community um, to build these, these training classes. And so not only are you getting, I think, I think I read on the blurb, Uh, over 40 years combined experience from two really excellent product owners, but both Don and Ralph are the stewards of of the course uh, that that thousands of people have taken through scrum.org to learn how to be product owners. You know, how has that influenced uh, the way that you you approach this book and how you're explaining all of the the things that, uh, like the three Vs and all these other, you know, great insights, you know, how has that really influenced and, and really helped shape this book? Well, it, it actually, it's, I think, it, in my opinion, is, Ralph, I don't know if he agrees with it, but not, but it, it's it's the reason for the book. Um, we've got a lot of passion around this. And the whole, I mean, give you a little bit of history on that. The whole reason um, the stewardship program exists the way it does today is that there was a conference, I think it was Agile 2015. Is that right, Ralph, in Washington, D.C.? That's right, yeah, it was Washington, yeah. D.C., yeah. We were, we were both there and uh, us and there was like three or four other product owner trainers sitting at the bar one night early on. I think it was like the first night of the conference. And we were we were talking a little bit about these things and, and saying, you know, like, what it, well, let's this product ownership is a big issue in the agile world. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure if the current professional product owner course addresses it. What are some things we'd like to see different? Um, how do we make it a little bit more about strategy than tactics and and um, and to cover these sorts of things that we're talking about, lean startup was a, was was get, starting to get popular back then, and that book by Eric Ries, and um, and so like how do we incorporate a lot of these ideas into it? And a few of us got pretty excited about it, and uh, we just said, let's just start doing it. Let's just start building this thing, and then we'll ask for we'll put it out there, and then we'll ask. Ken uh, Schwaber and the others at scrum.org about, hey, what do you think of this? Here's our proposal. Rather than constantly sending emails about things that should be done, why don't we just go do it? So a few of us, Ralph and I, and there were some other trainers too that came in and out, 
But, you know, Ralph and I, I think we skipped most of that conference. Just we, we got so energized about just sitting around working on this thing. And we put together a proposal. We actually created a bunch of different slides and exercises. Um, and uh, they got wind of it at scrum.org. And because of that, they uh, eventually asked us. I mean, this is fast forward a few months later. And once they incorporated a lot of those changes, they Dave West, who was fairly new CEO of Scrum.org, um, kind of had this idea of the stewardship programs based on the work we were doing. And the idea is that um, uh, there'd be a couple of stewards, like geographically dispersed around the world, um, that would be shepherding the courseware, and they would be fielding all inquiries and suggestions from other trainers in a very transparent way. Um, and, and they're there to serve the other trainers. And ultimately, you know, a year or two into that, I think it was about a year later, we said, well, you know, what about a book? Um, and I think it was Dave West that even brought up the idea with Ralph. Yeah. So yeah. I was uh, I was at the uh, Scrum Day conference in London, and it was May 2016, and I was sitting down with Dave West, and we were talking about things, and uh, how the stewardship is going. And at some point, the Don turns around and tells me, you know what? We need a good pro a book about product ownership. And he looked at me and just said, okay. So this was a clear hit. Don, and just say, hey, Don, uh, how about writing a book? And uh once it yes, and this is how the whole thing started. And our first plan was to be done in a year, like May 2017, so that we have something maybe actually to talk about the actual 2017 conference. But it was a good plan. Uh, it didn't hold up. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things was when Ralph, when Ralph approached me with it, I said, this, is, this will be my third attempt at a book. Um, and I said, it, it, one of the problems is that with, whether or not we get a publisher, not getting a publisher can sometimes take the wind out of the sails. And that's what's happened in the past. And I said, are you willing, are you passionate enough about this to focus on this and, and even self-publish if we have to? And he said, yes. And we started but without even a publisher. And it was later, it was, it was at Agile 2017 where um, uh, we, uh, we ran into, we were introduced to a publisher there. Uh, from Pearson, who um, who got this thing really going, but but it, we needed to know that we were going to do this with or without one, and that I think was the difference. Um, and and I think Ralph's energy really pushed me along uh, on some of this stuff, and just keeping the discipline of just moving forward no matter what. We always it, we always had the sense of moving forward. It was never, you know, we were just not not doing anything for months, even though there was like I had a baby during that time and. <laughs> There's a lot of distractions, and Ralph's like the busiest trainer in the world. Actually, with Scrum.org, uh, we were we were still able to make progress ever. So even if it was slow, we were always moving forward. Yeah, yeah. So in those two years, we have been working together. We had about seventy-five Skype conference calls. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, it's kind of like one every one and a half weeks, or one every ten days, something like that, and. Uh, especially during the time when, when Don had his baby, that we had a little bit less because, I mean, there was different priorities, which is okay. Uh, it's just that, you know, at some point, we, probably we talked like every other day on Skype towards the end. We probably saw each other more than our spouses at home. Um, yeah, it was a really interesting experience in that regard. Yeah, it sounds like just a really great collaboration from, you know, two of the... To, you know, two of the more experienced minds in the community about product ownership. And that's what got excited, you know, for what well, that was exciting for me about the book. You know, normally I don't pre order and I'll wait and see how reviews go. But, you know, I think I put out on LinkedIn just last night, went ahead and snatched up a copy. So when, when it comes out, hopefully it's at, at my doorstep. Um, so I think this is a much needed book. It's something that, you know, I, I've always been a fan of, of Bob Galen's uh, Scrum Product Ownership book, and I, I still think that's a, a really awesome reference to the role. Um, I really love how the, the professionalism, though, has been put first and foremost in, in your guys' effort. And, uh, and I'm really excited to get my hands on this book and see uh, just what the two of you have put together. Cool. Yeah, we're excited too. Man, nervous. I mean, I hope you guys do like it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So we'll definitely get uh, links to uh, to purchase the book into the show notes so that people can check it out and pre-order if they like. We'll get links to Amazon and to Pearson and, and all the other sites where uh, this is available so that people can pick and choose where they'd like, they'd like to get it from. 
Um, you know, at this point in the show, guys, I really leave it open to the guests to, you know, if you want to promote your companies, any upcoming uh, conference talks, any products, any training courses, anything like that. Uh, the floor is yours. Again, I promise to make sure that uh, people are well aware of the book and where to buy it. But uh, anything else, if you'd like to promote, Don, we'll start with you. Um, and also, please add, if people would like to continue the conversation with you, uh, how can they reach out uh, online? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm uh, I'm passionate about this stuff. I'm always happy to uh, to uh, talk to anyone about it. Uh, I, I can be found on LinkedIn pretty easily, Don McGrail. Um, and uh, I work for improving.com. So if you go to improving.com, you'll see there's a training area. You see a list of courses that uh, we teach. Um, we have offices. We do, we're regularly doing public um uh, classes in each of our offices throughout North America. So that's uh, Houston, Dallas, Minneapolis. We have two in Ohio, Cleveland and Columbus, and then also Calgary, um, Alberta. And uh, I'm also, uh, what I do a lot of is uh, uh, lunch and learn. So if you're in any of those areas and you'd like uh, me or somebody else in my company to come talk to you guys for 60 to 90 minutes on a uh, kind of a little lunch and learn or um, presentation, we have a whole slew of those where we're happy to do. Um, as well. And I think last time, Ryan, you had one of our coaches on there, Allison, who also works at Improving. Yeah, um, Allison so, Pollard. She yeah. was, uh, she's the latest episode as of right now, and uh, she's been on a few times, and she is, uh, she's amazing. So I am yeah, can't say enough good things about Improving and the coaches that, uh, that you keep on, the, keep on your staff. They're wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're, uh, I, I love the company, and I love the community here at Improving. So, Ralph, how about you? How can people continue the conversation, learn about more about you and what you have going on? Okay, so uh, as I said, I'm originally from Germany. I got around a little bit, but right now I'm and I'm being and I have my own company in Switzerland. Some company is called Effective Agile. Uh, it's a small, I say, boutique consulting company. We have four employees and uh, we have different specializations. So my my, my strong side is kind of uh, Scrum Agile. Uh, from a process management perspective. Um, and in that regard, I, I, I give trainings. Uh, we talked about at Scrum.org for Scrum.org. But I'm also helping uh, banks in Switzerland where we have a couple of uh, insurance companies. So actually, I'm kicking something off with the Swiss government right now, which is also interesting. So they're also picking up on HR. So uh, essentially, uh, I'm the counterpart for, for Don McGrill in Europe. So I'm kind of all over the place in Europe currently right now in Athens. Next week, I'm in the Netherlands and then back to Switzerland and so on. So um, you can reach me again also easily on LinkedIn, Ralph Jokam, J-O-C-H-A-M, or I'm on Twitter with Art Jokam. Um, I guess you Google me, you find me, you can just ping me and then we can uh, have a conversation. Well, I'll even do better than that for you, Ralph. I'll make sure that all the links you mentioned are in the show notes. So if listeners would like to reach out to either uh, Ralph or Don, we'll make sure that uh, all of that's readily available and possible. So guys, again, thank you for doing the show. Uh, thanks for taking some time out of your busy days. I know two, the two of you are two of the busier trainers uh, in the scrum.org community. So I really appreciate this and just want to wish you the best luck in the world with the book. And I, I just I hope you sell a million copies and it makes you wildly famous. <laughs> yeah me too thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> me too yeah. yeah thanks ryan appreciate it have yeah. fun yep. yeah thanks thanks for having us that's great oh anytime uh and i'm your host ryan ripley so i'm not gonna plug or promote anything at this point uh because by the time this is live it will have already passed <laughs> so i'm just gonna say thanks to the audience really appreciate the the downloads the tweets the notes every day i wake up to or throughout the day i see uh, just these wonderful tweets about people sharing the show, appreciating the guests, and just really love seeing that. And thank you for all of that. Uh, the downloads continue to increase. That means you're sharing the show, and, and that's the best way to show uh, support to us. It, the more downloads, the more listeners, the more opportunities, and it means that I can get great people like Don and Ralph to join us. So really appreciate the listeners out there. If you'd like to continue the conversation with me, you can hit me up on email, ryan at ryanripley.com, on Twitter, at Ryan Ripley, or check out the ryanripley.com website. There's plenty of opportunities to connect, uh, to reach out, and uh, to collaborate. Uh, looking forward to all of your messages there. So that's it for this week, everybody. Uh, this is Ryan Ripley saying, have a great, let's go with evening. 
Thanks for listening to Agile for Humans. Let's keep the conversation going. Drop us a question on Twitter at Agile for Humans or visit agileforhumans.com.